so the music that you're about to hear you know that music well. It's kind of timely given what, what we pray for and what we're talking about this time of year. I feel like we should all have caps and gowns on and maybe march around the room. Wait for, wait for an inspiring speech. This music was actually written by a man named Edward Elder. Edward Elder was a Britishman and he was a composer uh, himself of, of quite a bit of music. And that song became the first song that ever got a standing ovation at an outdoor walk-by concert series in England. They have these things called proms, promenades, where they have, they, have, they have groups play different music and people just walk by. But this one, when it was debuted at that prom, people stopped and listened and applauded. Standing ovation twice. That took note of the music. So not long after, there was a king who was being, uh, who was being crowned. It was King Edward VII at the time. He was looking for music for his coronation, and he chose that song for his coronation. He also had lyrics written to it, very patriotic British lyrics, and that was the song which, at the time, we now know the name, was Pomp. And circumstance. Very appropriate that it was named Pomp and Circumstance. Well, Edward Elmer went on in his career and he was eventually given an honorary doctorate in the United States through Yale. So he comes to Yale to receive his honorary doctorate and when he comes to receive it, they play some of his music. This is one of the songs that they play at his reception for his honorary doctorate. And that's what it caught on as the graduation song. And it was like within just a few years, you know, one college did it, and they said, that's a great idea. And then another college did it, they said, this is the thing to do. And it just ballooned and went wild. And now everybody uses it. So why? Why does that song work so well? Two reasons, at least, but two reasons for our purposes today. Number one, it's triumphant. You know, it's got that slow, driving kind of tempo. It's, it, it has this regal, triumphant feel like we succeeded. We finished well. We're, we're at the last days of our college, graduate, university career, and we finished well. And it's a triumphant kind of feel. The, the second part is that it's a march. It's actually written as a march. The whole song is a series of a trio of marches. And marches don't just celebrate what we have done. Marches also give us confidence to go forward and to push us into the next thing that we might be doing. Kind of like graduation. We celebrate what happened, but that is by no means all that there is because there's always a next step when it comes to graduation of what's ahead. Not unlike what we've been talking about for weeks. We've been talking about these last but not least moments. These times in the life of Jesus that are sort of seeming to be the last things that happen, the post-Easter things that happen, these little episodes, these little events that happen, but they are so important because they're not the least important things. They're not just add-ons to the story of Jesus. They are such important last events that, in particular, help us to see what's next. Because Jesus never just ended something and said, well, that's it. He said, there's always something next. So this episode that we're going to look at today, which is the last of our last but not least episodes, it, it really shows what Jesus had in mind when he was pushing people into what is next for them, for the disciples, and also for us. So we, we've been saying that these are last but not least, and that's a little bit of a misnomer because a lot of these last but not least episodes are more like next to last, or second to last, or not quite last episodes. Because they're not the literal last ones, they're just close. This one today is true to form. This is the last episode in the life of Jesus. 
Uh, you will see it clearly because Jesus actually leaves during this episode. So this is it, folks. This is the end. This is the last episode. And in this last episode, it really does show when Jesus leaves, when Jesus does his last thing, then there is still something next for us. Most of these next or these, these last stories appear in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right at the end, you know, the ending paragraph, the ending pages in those books. This one actually comes at the beginning of the book of Acts. Uh, where we, as we've seen before, the Gospel of Luke sort of finishes, but then Luke writes Acts, so he just picks up where he left off, kind of like writing volume two of his own story. And so this, this is the first part of his book of Acts. And, and it makes sense, if he finished the story of Jesus with his gospel, he's going to pick up the story of Acts with Jesus also. Jesus is the beginning of this whole story that launches it into the next step. So, to get our bearings just of where we are and what's been happening, Easter was not long ago. We can all still sort of remember Easter, can't we? I mean, it was seven weeks ago. It's not that far. We can remember Easter egg months. We can remember uh, flowers on the cross outside. We can remember resurrection donuts that we got to eat. I mean, we can remember all sorts of good things that happened on Easter. It wasn't that long ago. And it wasn't that long ago for the disciples either. It wasn't that long ago that they found the tomb empty. It wasn't that long ago that the women came back from the tomb and said, Jesus isn't there. And they had to go through all of this figuring out what happened. And over the course of just a couple weeks, they figured out this really did happen. Jesus is alive. He appeared to us. He showed himself to us. He showed us his hands. He showed us his wounds. He talked to us. He ate meals. He proved he's not a ghost. He proved that he is real. And there was all this, this establishment that this really happened. And after those first couple weeks, Jesus like shifts into a whole different way of interacting with the disciples. He moves from, it really happened, to, now let's get going. And they have those conversations that we looked at, like the, that miraculous catch of fish outside the boat, and Jesus having conversations with them about commissioning them to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has these conversations, these interactions with them, to say there's something else happening. And that's where Jesus continues with that whole idea that there is something next. So, that's where we pick up this final episode, this final conversation that Jesus has in the book of Acts. So right at the beginning, here's how it goes. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So what does Jesus do to sort of move us and push us into those next steps? Well, I, I love this, that it starts really with the disciples. You know, the, the whole picture is of the disciples, and they, they, they're the ones who start the conversation. And what are the disciples paying attention to? What are the disciples kind of stuck on? What are the disciples thinking? I mean, they're thinking, well, Jesus, when are you going to do your next miracle? You know, you've done all these other things, you've made the two men, you've risen from the dead, you've shown yourself as, I mean, what's next? We know that you're going to do this restore the kingdom thing, so when are you going to do it? But where's Jesus' attention? Jesus' attention is not on what he's going to do. Jesus' attention is on the disciples. So while the disciples are asking, Jesus, what are you going to do? Jesus is telling them what they now need to do. I mean, it's, it's four times that Jesus says, you 
are going to do something. You should not be concerned about these things. You will receive this. You will be this. You will do this. Jesus is, is turning the whole conversation toward them. And I love also that, that Jesus does it in a pretty blunt way. You know, the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, when are you going to do this big thing of restoring the kingdom? Jesus is like, that's not for you to know. Don't worry about it. Don't be concerned about it. That's not your territory. But instead, your job was this. I mean, it's like, it's like he's saying, you guys, ask yourself and figure out and pour yourself into what's your next step? What's the next thing that's going to happen? What's the next thing that God is leading you to do? What is the next thing that is, is time for that must be done? What's, what's your next step? I mean, all the time, we're constantly asking, you, what's the next step? How, how do I make this choice well? How do I spend my time in the right way? How do I love that person in the right way when it's really hard? How do I encourage and build up this situation? How do I fix this? What's the next step in all kinds of different areas? And when we're trying to make a decision or figure out what the next step is, I, I don't know about you, but I, I often feel like I need to be, I need to be empowered. I need to be, I need more than I have. I need something else. Because sometimes it's just hard. It doesn't come clearly. The great thing is. Jesus fills this passage, this conversation, with empowerment in several ways. I mean, look how Jesus empowers us. God the Father has all the authority. The Holy Spirit comes upon us. And Jesus is the source and the subject of our next step. I mean, they, it's like they've got it all covered. God's got all the authority in heaven on earth. God has everything at God's disposal and God's creative and enduring and everlasting power. He sends the Holy Spirit on us to do all kinds of things, comfort us, bring truth, help us discern, help us to understand, help us to uh, figure out truth from falsehood. I mean, the Spirit does all kinds of things in coming upon us. And Jesus himself is the example. He's lived the, the life that we live. He's lived through everything we deal with. He understands it. And so we get to live kind of in his footsteps. So, What's left? I mean, God's got the authority, the Spirit comes on us, and Jesus is bending. What's left for us but to take the next step? We've got everything at our disposal, everything behind us, everything that can empower us, so our job is to take the next step. And that's Jesus' point. When we're trying to make those next steps, when we're trying to be faithful, when we're trying to choose wisely, when we're trying to do well, when we're trying to understand and have the capacity to do it well, and do it enough, when we're trying to do all these things, we have everything we need because God has given it to us. So we can say that we own our next step. It's our job. We own our next step, but we're not on our own in our next step. Because God's authority is with us. Jesus' spirit has been poured out on us. And God's authority is with us. The Spirit has been poured on us, and Jesus walks with us and before us. We have everything we need. The thing that happens next is odd. Um, go back and look at it just for a second. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while we were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white robed men suddenly stood among them, men of Galilee. They said, why are you standing in here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven the same way you saw him go. That doesn't happen every day, does it? I mean, we're walking along and there's all of a sudden two white robed men sitting there and they have a conversation with us. But this did happen before, didn't it? When did we last see two white robed men standing and have a conversation with us? Yeah, Easter, at the tomb, when it was empty, you know, they're, they're looking inside, whoever it was, disciples, women, they're looking inside, and they see the white of men, and the guys are like, why are you looking in here? He's not dead, he's gone. Same kind of thing here. Why are you looking up into heaven? He's gone. There's nothing to see here. Have you ever seen a rocket launch? Like a real rocket launch? I mean, some, some of us have, some of us 
you know, TV or live. Um, I had a friend whose dad had a, a top floor apartment overlooking the Kennedy Space Center. And I, I visited one time and I saw this view. I mean, it was incredible. It was, it was kind of one of those views where you could just stand there and stare at this amazing place uh, forever. And, and he saw many rocket launches from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, you know how it goes, you know, the, when there's a launch, the crowds all form way ahead of time. Then the launch countdown it happens, you see the smoke, the, the plume of the steam and exhaust, the rocket goes up, there's the trail of, of bright light and fire, and then there's the smoke trail. And then people watch. You know, we, we watch it go up, and the cameras track it as far as they can, and people don't go anywhere. You know, they're just still looking at this thing. Like, there is, I can't see it. Ah, but it was cool, I know it's up there. And that's what the disciples are doing. They're just watching. Even though Jesus is gone, they're just still watching. We love to watch Jesus. But there's more than just watching Jesus. Because if we only watch, we'll never take a next step. We need to take that next step. And sometimes it takes <coughs> courageousness to be able to take that next step. But that's why Jesus said, My Spirit will lead with you, God the Father is all the authority, and I have walked your life before you walked it. We have that to rely on the God of the world. Where were they when all this was happening? See, right after Easter, you know, they left and they went to Galilee, so they took to the outlands, to the hill country. They left. They weren't in, you know, the hub anymore. They went out there and they did all these things with Jesus. But then they came back to Jerusalem, to the center, to the hub. They're, they're in Jerusalem right now. Why are they in Jerusalem? Why did they come back? Well, they came back because everybody came back. This was Pentecost. They came back for the party, for the festival. People did every year. Three times a year, everybody descended on Jerusalem. The city ballooned three times its population. I mean, imagine Visalia becoming 500,000 people overnight. Absolutely mesmerizing to think how many people were there. But they came to celebrate Pentecost. And Pentecost was all about the Ten Commandments. It was a whole celebration every year because people were celebrating that God gave them the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm not sure that we can garner that many people to celebrate the Ten Commandments today because you know, we think about the Ten Commandments and we think rules. God gave us ten big rules. Good rules, but they're rules. They didn't think about them just as rules. They thought about them and they saw them and they understood them as God is showing you how God wants a relationship between God and us to work. I mean, this, when God revealed the Ten Commandments to them, that was the first time that they knew God. And before that, they didn't know God, they just sort of knew that there was God. But this was the first time when God said, I am telling you, I want a relationship with you, and here's how it's going to work. And the people are thinking, this is incredible, I've never experienced this before. God wants a relationship with us, this is awesome. So the Ten Commandments were like the invitation to a relationship with God. So these people were all here celebrating how amazing it is that God wants a relationship with them. And as they're all gathered there, suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm that filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. There were also Jewish people, devout Jewish people, from all over the world in Jerusalem. They heard this and came running to find out what it was. They were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How could this be? These people are from Galilee, and we hear them speaking in our own native languages. We all hear these people speaking in their own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. What is going on? The Holy Spirit has come 
in fire, tongues of fire. It's just like power. The Holy Spirit has filled the disciples like the wind and the breath that the Spirit is. The Holy Spirit has given them the ability to speak languages, kind of like the Spirit gives gifts. I mean, this is, this is fully God's presence resting on these people. The Holy Spirit empowered them and breathed life into them and equipped them and pushed them into their next step. God provided what they needed. The next step of showing the wonderful things God has done, and as they were speaking about it, sharing about it, and communicating the wonderful things that God has done, they were basically telling about a relationship with God. They were telling about how good God is, what God has done, how everybody can be in a relationship with God. They were the new Ten Commandments. They were pouring out a new relationship with God and showing the people what God had started so long ago and what they were celebrating at that moment. They were the new Ten Commandments. We are the new Ten Commandments in our day, sharing about a relationship with God with the people that we get to be around. May it be that the Holy Spirit fills us to be able to share God's great love with whoever we're with. And may God's authority go with us. May Jesus' example walk ahead of us so that we might be able to share the love and the grace of God with anyone that we're with. Let's pray.